thanks for taking the time to download this BBC Radio 5 Live podcast. To search for other podcasts you might like, click bbc.co.uk slash 5 Live, where you'll also find our terms of use. Sounds of Africa there to once again kick off our world football phone-in this morning. If you'd like to join in the conversation, simple things. Just give us a call on 0500 909 693. That's 0500 909 693. And talking of Africa this morning, we're talking of football in Africa and players from over there playing in our leagues with our Springbok junior, Mark Gleeson, who is in Cape Town. Are you, Mark? Yes, I am. Morning, Norton. Good morning to you, sir. And we've got our legendino, Tim Vickery, in Rio. Are you this morning, Tim? I certainly am, yeah. Morning, Dotton. Morning, Mark. Morning, everyone. And so they're taking care of football in Africa and South America, respectively, and players from over there playing in our leagues. And with your permission, Mark, let's let's give this uh, Legendino a chance to crow a little bit because wasn't it you, Legendino, that once said, you can always be sure that Tottenham will let you down eventually (laughs) in the league. You can always be sure of that. That's what you said, didn't you? Uh, yeah, I've, I've had a lot of experience of this. You know, you, you you reach half a century and you've seen you've seen most things. You know, you sat by the river long enough to see the bodies of some of your enemies float by. Is that you've the also river sat Lee? By the river. Is that the river Lee? Yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah, um, you've also sat by the river long enough to uh, to add to add some some tears to the water um, with a few Tottenham defeats. Yeah, talking of rivers, all I can think about when you said that was lazy bones sitting in the sun. How do you expect to get your day's work done? Uh, but this is a football phone-in, isn't it? So let's you, carry you, on. You, that's the f- quickest you've ever broken the no singing uh, uh, restriction. The quickest, isn't it? I must never... try harder. <laughs> <laughs> so, for you, Mark Gleeson, this question from Warren in Manchester. Amir Zaki of Egypt was superb at Wigan. How is he heralded in Africa today? Well, he was not the biggest name in African football. I think, um, in a sense, a sort of a middle-of-the-road export. And I think it's made uh, probably exacerbated by the fact he's Egyptian. You know, they don't uh, get much of a following Egyptian players elsewhere around the continent. But... Uh, he certainly, uh, he was certainly one of a, a vanguard of um, Egyptian players that made the the breakthrough. You know, because Egypt's been so successful and because the league has been so well established over there, it was, for all of its achievement, it was quite surprising how few Egyptian players made the um, move across the waters at at the time when there was this massive exodus of African footballers and when basically that exodus began and the Egyptians were certainly a decade, decade and a half behind uh, in terms of exporting their best players. I mean, these days, of course, Mohamed Salah and El Seni and, and uh, et cetera, et cetera, all playing around um, the top leagues of Europe. And if you look at the Egyptian squad announced for the upcoming Nations Cup, it's full of foreign-based players. But, you know, less than 10 years ago, that used to be a fair anomaly. Uh, and Zaki was one of them, um, a, 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 an Egyptian international based with a club in Europe. Uh, Tim, can you tell Willie in Glasgow about the Santos midfield player that Manchester United are rumoured to be interested in? He's, he's apparently being talked of as the new Fabregas. I don't know who it is. OK. Uh, who, is this, who is this mystery man? I don't Do we know. have a name supplied? Well, no, or you're, you're the one who does to, that. To pick out, don't well, give I us the homework. Pick out a Santos midfielder yeah, yeah, at pick will. out one. Yeah, go on then. Pick one out at will. Anyone. Well, I mean, the, the big name is uh, is is not a not a midfielder, not a Fabregas midfielder. It's and maybe they're thinking of Thiago Maia, who uh, well, he's not really Fabregas. He's, he's he's got quite a nice left foot as a, as a central midfielder, but I don't quite see him in a Fabregas mould. And the, the the best young thing at Santos at the moment is is Gabriel, um, Gabriel Barbosa, who's left-footed striker can play wide on the front three can yeah. play right up front as well and is 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 very very talented I've just looked um, at, I've just looked so online I think it is uh, Thiago Maia that they're talking about the Red Devils have apparently we, made a bid for him 
in which case, give me a round of applause, please, for plucking that one out from well, thin no, air with very, no, very little no, help. No, no, you, you, you were getting three or four options there. It wasn't like you plucked one out of thin air. You were offering well, us one. I said, he, I said he, he's the midfielder, yeah. but the, the, the main name as a young star right, is Gabriel right. Barbosa, who the I point think was, you'll you be able to see in the Olympics this year. Yeah, but you didn't know which one was the point, Tim. I'm not trying to be fun. I'm not trying to do a Jeremy Paxman on you, but look, you be real <laughs> now. You didn't pluck one out of thin air. You plucked four out of thin air. For us to choose no, from. I mentioned two names and said only one of them is a midfielder. Yeah. Although okay. I don't think he's quite in a in, in, in a Fabregas class. So I'll give you that. Uh, you I'll can pack that. you can pack your Anglo Saxon Jeremy Paxson act away. Thank you very much. <laughs> so is he any good? <laughs> well, no, I think he think he's a I think he's a good player. I think he think he's he's a promising player. I think he's helped by the fact that he's got an excellent front line to deal with, and I think he's got the best all round midfielder in Brazil alongside him, who's a guy called Lucas Lima, who's who's in the Brazil squad. Um, so uh, I think the collective context is working in his favour. Uh, difficult to judge him because Santos are only playing the, the Sao Paulo State Championship, which ain't worth a hill of beans. Um, perhaps a player to watch during the Brazilian Championship, which doesn't start until, uh, until mid-May. Um, but one for the notebook without being a player who you, you, you'd be leaping up and, jump, and jumping. That's our Fabregas getting him in the Premier League. Not, not just yet, anyway. Yeah, Mark, this is a question I think we had last time you were on, but it's certainly one that people are interested in. Whether This is from Andrew, by the way. Whether the Chinese Super League is a tempting offer for African players in the way that it's been over the last year or so for South American players? Yeah, I think uh, money has no has no uh, race, creed, or color in this sense, and uh, <laughs> yes. it's attractive. To, it's attractive for everyone. In fact, I think the the BBC show World Football a few weeks ago had a had a very nice uh, interview with Colo Toure, where he um, went on about how um, how good it was for African footballers. And I think it's particularly good for for players of his ilk in, in the sense that they're sort of winding down on their career in uh, in Europe and in. Particularly in England, in a in a, ho- in a high profile league, and then get the opportunity for that final payday, which perhaps up to now has been restricted really to the MLS, um, which is not that fabulous a payday, I don't think, for for players of uh, of, of his caliber. So uh, I think they're all very excited about the Chinese league. We haven't really had much, uh, have, haven't had many uh, Africans going that way. Obafemi Martins went there from from the states to China. Um, but in terms of high-profile signings, there's been a lot of speculation about Yaya Toure going from Man City at the end of this, at the end of this season. But I, uh, you know, we wait to see what what happens there, and we wait to see, of course, what Guardiola does about Toure, who who uh, was not no favourite of his when he was at Barcelona. Yeah, are you listening, Tim Vickery? Are you listening and learning? That is how you get a round of applause when you answer a question definitively. Mark said. Straight away, money has no colour, creed or religion, yeah? That's how you get a round of applause. Now, Alex wants to know from you, Tim, how, does, how do you rate the chances of the Colombian teams winning in the Copa Libertadores this season, Atletico Nacional and also Santa Fe in particular, looking very impressive so far? And lastly, do you think or do you see Marlos Moreno and Orlando Berrio making the Colombia Copa America squad for the summer? Well, yeah, and Marlos Moreno is in the squad for the World Cup qualifiers, which will be happening well, um, on Thursday and then the following Tuesday. So and Ma- Marlos Moreno, uh, I-, I said, and, and I- 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 at this point, I'm going to have to demand a round of applause, not, not-, not request one, but demand one. I said uh, late last year that he was probably the best young talent in South American football. Um, after watching him just for two months with, with Atletico Nacional. And he's been the sensation of the Libertadores, and he scored in all three of Atletico Nacional's first, uh, first three games uh, and looks absolutely sensational, just looks on fire. So individually talented and so collectively minded as well. Um, Orlando Berillo is a very strong right-sided uh, player, uh, more, much more limited than, than, than Marlos Moreno. Um, will perhaps get into the, into the squad for the Copa America if it's an experimental squad, which is, which is a possibility. Um, these two Colombian sides, Atletico Nacional and Santa Fe, are looking good in the Libertadores, especially Nacional, who are the only club 100%. Doesn't that tell you a lot about the difference between the Libertadores and the Champions League? Much, much more parity in the Libertadores. You don't have that big difference in quality. We're over halfway through the group stage and Atletico Nacional, the only club with a 100% record. The group is not particularly strong. And also, there are no real prizes for qualifying best. 
And last year, of all of the 16 clubs that qualified, the one with the worst record were River Plate of Argentina, who went on to win the thing. So it, it, it really is, it's all about just qualifying. How you, it, how you do it doesn't matter too much. And you worry sometimes when the teams get off to such a great start that uh, sometimes they can believe their own hype and get knocked out quickly when the knockout round starts. But Atletico Nacional are looking, looking very impressive. I picked them out before the competition as one of the favourites. Um, usually the, 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 the trophy goes to a club either from Brazil or Argentina. In the last decade, only once has it avoided Brazil or Argentina. But I think Atletico Nacional are as strong as, as, as anyone in the group, um, in, in the competition. Santa Fe are also... A good side. They've got the best, one of the best young centre backs in the continent. A guy called Yeri Mina, who's uh, all right. He's a centre back, centre back. He's, he's no great stylist, but my God, does he deal with the aerial threat? A big surprise to me that he's still in South American football. I think he he would do well in in Europe. The thing I worry about a little bit with Santa Fe is at the top level, where are the goals going to come from? Um, that might be their undoing, and they fa- they still face a battle to qualify. I think it's gonna it's gonna come down to their last game of the group phase, which is a way to settle Porteño of, uh, of, of Paraguay. Um, so they, they still face a battle to, uh, to, to, to qualify. Atletico Nacional, I think, are a team to, uh, to watch because they have the potential to go all the way. Yeah, Mark, I'm sorry about this, but Tim's been away from here for so long. He actually thinks that the protagonist can demand a standing ovation. It doesn't work that way, Tim. A standing ovation comes very naturally, as you know, Mark, very naturally indeed. So what I'm going to ask listeners to do, text us on 85058 and tell us when an answer deserves a standing ovation, whether from Mark or Tim. So we'll soon see who rules North London. 0500 909... You're welcome, Mark. 05, you, obviously... I, my money's on you. 0500... Yes, my, my money's on myself, too. <laughs> and and Tim's, Tim's putting his money on our house as well, <laughs> apparently. Well, he's already asked for two and he's got zero, so I he's know. on top. Isn't it sad? Well, oh, I've, I, I've, I've given Mark a silent round of applause for every answer that he's given so far. I know, that's I thought why we were all playing on the same team. Well, hang on a second. We may be playing on the same team, but as you've often said, you see, I'm quoting yourself back to you. It's who who bangs. It's he who bangs the goals in that deserves the applause. Not the defenders. Not the defenders. All you've been doing tonight is defending. Now we want some goals banged in, if you don't I'm, mind. I'm quite happy to do that unseen work that only the knowledgeable heads in the crowd really no, no. appreciate. I'm quite happy to do that. A moment that. ago, you were demanding a standing ovation, and I'm simply asking <laughs> listeners to contribute with their Don own. Adebayo, coherence is the last refuge of the unimaginative. <laughs> I don't know who said that, but whoever Might said that... Might well have been that, Oscar Wilde, but it yeah, was certainly me. Yeah. But whoever and I'm said not, that... I'm not even asking for a round of applause. If no, it no, happens, it happens. If that wasn't a round of applause <laughs> kind of uh, comment. Anyway, it's back to Mark Gleeson. <laughs> the important stuff is about the football, but do text us 85058 when you hear an answer that deserves a standing ovation, please. And make sure you let us know who gets that standing ovation, whether it be the legend The show dealer. does. We're all on the same I know, of course, the show will get it overall. But Mark, Tim, are you worried? Are you worried? No need to be worried. You asked for a standing ovation. We're going to see if you're going to get one. Anyway, as I was asking Mark, this is from our listener. Who's the greatest player from Southern Africa? Is it Kalusha or Benny McCarthy? Who's Kalusha? Kalusha Bwalia is the only um, player from the region to have been... um, crowned African Football of the Year back in 1988 when um, he was really the star of the Zambian side that did very well at the Seoul Olympics in the days when uh, Africa still sent a full-strength national team to that tournament before it became a sort of an under-23 event. It was a it was a massive breakthrough event for Africa in the sense that um, they, they got results, uh, morale-boosting results against European and South American opposition for the very first time. There was a very famous game between Zambia and Italy, which um, Zambia won four one. The Italian side was made had a couple of um, full internationals, about three or four, but was made up um, mainly of um, Serie A players who, who didn't have an international pedigree. But obviously, in those days, it was a massive breakthrough. So Kalusha won the won the African Football of the Year in nineteen eighty eight. He played for PSV Eindhoven under Bobby Robson, although he was he sort of floated in and out of the side and later went on to um, play in Mexico. Um, and he is now the president of Zambian football. He's, he was formerly the coach and the captain. 
now the president of Zambian football. He lives uh, a lot of his time in South Africa, uh, and he's become a, a an executive member of uh, the Confederation of African Football. And there's a hope one day that um, he might turn out to be the president of African football because it'd be nice to have a footballing type uh, instead of a political type at the top of the, of the tree. So we we look forward to that. He's a he's a wonderful gentleman. Um, Benny McCarthy never won it. Um, and he really had one great year, which was 1998, when he was the top scorer at the Nations Cup. And uh, South Africa, is, he did very well with South Africa, reached the final. But on the criteria of African Football of the Year, probably Kalusha should should get it. But in terms of a career profile, um, Benny playing in, in Spain with Celta Vigo and finishing behind Drogba in the goal-scoring charts when he was at Blackburn, probably cuts him out as uh, as the best footballer we've had from the Southern African region. But it is a debate that I think um, were you to, to launch it um, into into this region uh, would, would, would be a rather heated one. So um, it would be interesting to hear what people from the Southern African region say. Once they've, uh, once they've applauded, perhaps they could then um, text in who they think uh, is better, Kalusha or, or Benny. Indeed, and I can tell you that Benny, who I've bumped into here at Five Live, uh, still rocks the style, I can tell you that. He's got a fashion sense about him. Nothing to do with the football. And by the way, Tim, apologies, Margaret says that I should stop bullying you, but I'm not bullying you, am I? I'm just taking the words out of your mouth and trying to make them haunt you, if you see what I mean. It's not bullying, we're hurling friends. them back at me. Yeah, but in, we're friends. In, in, a, we're in friends. a spirit of contempt. No, not at all, not in a spirit of contempt. I would truly like to know whether mm. you deserve a standing ovation tonight. That's simply that. Anyway, this question for you, for both of you, really. Uh, this is from Chris in Newcastle. What is the travelling away fan culture like in your respective regions? Do thousands of people travel from one place to another to see an away match, or is it mainly hooligans? That's his question, yeah. Tim. Well, in Argentina at the moment, they don't travel at all because away fans are banned. Um, a lot of the, 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 the tradition of, of South American football is on local derbies, city derbies, and it's a big, big place um, without, uh, without uh, transport infrastructure like there is in England. I mean, travelling support in England really kind of only comes in a mass sense regularly with the, the, the construction of the motorways. And before that, we, we've talked about this before, you know, if you're in Manchester, you might go and see City one week and United the next. You might support one or the other, but you go and watch both because you didn't have the option of following the team away. Uh, the, the, the competition in England was always national. And in a lot of South American countries, really, it's one capital city which dominates. So, you know, the, the travelling support just has to travel across, across the city. Um, the idea of, of travelling to other cities... It happens, but it, it's not it, it's it's not as as normal. And there's a there's a story from the mid 70s um, about the invasion of Corinthians of the Maracanã. It was a decisive game uh, between Corinthians of São Paulo and Fluminense of Rio here in Rio in the Maracanã. Uh, and and this is still something which is talked about massively. The invasion of Corinthians fans. They came in there thousands and thousands and thousands, and there were more Corinthians fans in the stadium than there were Fluminense fans. Well, it's a six-hour six-hour drive. You know, it's something that, in in the context of English football, um, is not even remotely remarkable. But because it's 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 rarer in in Brazil and in South America, this transhumance, you know, this six-hour journey or or, or forty-minute plane ride has has gone down in legend. So uh, the, the kind of long-distance travelling that England fans do is is not as common. I remember when he was a goalkeeper at Tottenham and Gomez talking about being amazed at the game in Newcastle, you know, away at Newcastle, uh, and the away end absolutely full of Tottenham fans, you know, the, the, the distance that they travelled to, to see their team. Um, it's, it, it is part of South American football, but long-distance travelling is, isn't as, as normal as it is in England. How about in South Africa, uh, Mark? It's, it's, it's really ditto for Africa. It's exactly the same. I mean, the distances on the continent are massive. Uh, the, the transport infrastructure is not what it is in Europe, but I think uh, I'm interested to hear what Tim says about you know, the motorways being the catalyst. I, I, you know, I'm wondering whether it wasn't trains, and I, I'd be, I'd be interested to hear uh, maybe a bit more of an explanation from him about that. But but um, here we do get, we get a little bit, but but very little, and, and exactly as Tim suggests, uh, you know, some of the rivalries where you do get a, 
a, um, a decent uh, sector of fans from both clubs involved is completely restricted to the derbies, and it's it, it what make it's uh, it is what makes the derbies the uh, the extra special events that they are on the African continent. We have um, some absolutely massive derbies from you know from Casablanca to Cape Town. There are some some fabulous games, and, I, and a lot of that's got to do with the fact that um, away fans don't really travel elsewhere. Um, but but yes, South America and, and Africa, the parallels on on that particular case are, are much the same. Casablanca. What, what about to Cape with, the, with the World Cup? The, um, the 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 transport infrastructure. I think there were train investment in trains and so on for the World Cup. Um, has uh, has that has that really been viable? Has that helped football? Has that helped society? No, we, we, we it was there, there's very little train culture in South Africa. Um, the the World Cup there was a lot of investment in the in the uh, tourist infrastructure, but it was it was aimed really at that at, at tourism. We had massive overhauls of the airports. Um, they are all swanky, sparkling affairs to this day, um, and and thanks to the World Cup, and there was quite a quite a bit of uh, infrastructural development, particularly around Johannesburg, um, sort of a. There's a ring road around Johannesburg, which went from sort of four lanes to six lanes. So that's that's helped a lot um, post World Cup as well. But but I, I, you know I think for, uh, the real legacy of the World Cup eventually, I think for South Africa will will be the the tourism aspect. Um, this, a getting the country's name out there, people coming down, discovering how cheap it is, and actually how practically easy it is to get around it. But there's always been a good uh, transport and road infrastructure, but in this country, we drive everywhere, and, and you know, a, a six-hour trip is, you know, from Durban, from Johannesburg to Durban, for example, for the weekend is is nothing for 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 many people. Get on, get in the car on Friday or after work and head down to the coast for the weekend is is pretty common. So, um, getting in your car and driving long distances, but it hasn't really translated to football. So, for example, if Bloemfontein Celtic, who uh, are a well-supported side in the in, in the Free State capital, and because they're a separate city, have a decent have a decent following of their own. Play a match in Johannesburg, you would have maybe I don't know 100. I, I watched the game on Wednesday in Pretoria, where they had maybe 100, 200 fans, and essentially it's a it's a four five hour road trip, which could be made by thousands. So there isn't really that that culture of moving around, and because. Um, it, uh, you know, uh, it's got to, it's got to do with uh, it's got to do with disposable income as well, uh, I think. But it's it's uh, it's just never really been a, a big part of the of the football culture here, where people get on the road and go those kind of distances or, or that kind of time on the road to go watch their team. Yeah, Tim, you're not allowed to do your famous black country accent tonight because remember I told you that one of our security guards here isn't too happy about it because he's from the black country. Whenever you do that accent, I can't even leave the building without him accosting me uh, because of you. Now, people will remember that last week you famously displayed your Geordie. Do you remember that? Vaguely, yeah. Yeah, well, yeah. You, you, you were trying to imitate what Rafa Benitez might sound like in a couple of weeks' time <laughs> after he adopted the Scouser when he went to Liverpool. Well, not everybody is enamoured with your Geordie. Yeah. Bernard in Newcastle is with us. Bernard, good morning. Hello, Dom. Do you want me to keep the accent until later? Hang on, I thought you were going to do your Geordie accent. Why are you speaking in a cockney? Well, I can't put my Geordie accent on if you want you now. That's still sounding cockney to me, mate. Well, Benitez was interviewed last week, and the picture I had of him was actually of René and Alo Alo trying to speak English with the accent that they put on. Yeah, and now you're sounding a bit Spanish to me. When are you going to do touch the Jordan? Oh. Well, what was that, Mark? And a touch Welsh, there's a little boy well, all coming. This is true. Well. Uh, Bernard, you're, to, you're sounding cockney Welsh and... And Spanish. When are well, you going to give us the Geordie? My accent has changed because I'm working on the railways. I had to be understood by people who worked in Darlington and York ah. and further south a lot of the time. Ah, you see. So you're, I've you're actually southerners. Me, and they would never understood me at all. Yeah, you see, you're not in the in the perfect position to be criticising uh, Tim Vickery's Geordie then, are you? Well, he can probably do a much better Portuguese accent than me. Yeah, he can, he can. <laughs> Let's just have another taste of your Geordie, if you don't mind, Tim, just so that we compare it with Bernard's. Do you mind? Well, I'll give him what you have to have need in uh, Dutton. <laughs> Tim, that was an excellent Geordie accent. So you finally, caught, you finally managed to do it. 
Yeah, yeah. I did it by proxy. I got Bernie to do it for me. Yeah, yeah. I think that's about as much as we can. And you've got a question as well, Bernard. Yes. Who was the Argentine fullback Birmingham City board? I think it was after a World Cup. Tarantini. Tarantini. Yeah, not to be mistaken with the famous film director. Well, that's why I was always getting the names mixed up. Yeah. But one, one's a hateful eight and the other one's just an inside right. <laughs> I'll take your word for that. Yeah, I thought it was. I thought that was very clever by me, actually. I uh, thought, uh, of course, yeah, 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 last week, gotten with that email I sent you. I hope the one I've sent this week is uh, more easy for you, and you can read it out. Yeah, unlike the one last week. <laughs> Bernard, thank you very much, and thanks for the Geordie accent as well. At least we're teaching these I Portuguese. Wanna know, I want to know if, if 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 Bernie knows the story. I had a Geordie mate once who who, who taught me a rhyme about a, a poor lad from Newcastle yeah. who'd misplaced his marble, and the first line was "War Geordie's lost his." Pinker. And there were other lines as well, full of like Geordie slang, but I just can't remember them. And, and I don't know if you can repeat them on air either. That's good. I'm glad that we've lost Bernard. 0500 909 693. We're talking football in Africa and South America and players from over there playing in our leagues. Give us a call. Uh, 0500 909 693. And this one, Mark, uh, after the tra this is from Waze, after the tragic car crash, is Peter Love involved in Zimbabwean uh, football and where do they rank in Africa? Uh, Peter Ndlovu um, is no longer uh, is not involved in Zimbabwean football. He's the manager of the South African uh, top of the table club Mamelodi Sundowns, and by manager, uh, I mean the the sort of administrative manager, the guy who organises the bus and gets the airline tickets and makes sure that the team is there on time. Um, he's done that job for a a couple of years now, and uh, they are this morning in the Congo, in a place called Delisi, where they are playing a African Champions League match, 2-0 up from the first leg last week and uh, facing a rather tough tie. Um, he, he was obviously, um, he was the first African in the, in the Premier League, which is why he's, he's quite famous in the UK, mispronounced his name for years and years and years, um, played for, for Coventry and for Birmingham, uh, amongst others, and uh, Came back uh, when he when he sort of finished uh, in the UK. Came to South Africa and played um, for a couple of seasons. He was a little bit past it, but was still a very popular figure because of what he'd achieved in um, in in, uh, in in Britain or in England specifically. Uh, and and the story about the car crash is uh, he he was driving the car where which which um, I think was speeding and overturning his brother Adam, who was also a Zimbabwean international footballer, played for many years in Switzerland, was killed tragically in that. In, in that crash, they're a they're a big footballing family. The Glovos from from Bulawayo, about uh, three brothers played for Zimbabwe. But uh, Peter doesn't, uh, I think, go back to Zimbabwe much. Maybe you know once or twice a year um, to visit friends and family. But it's very much based in in Johannesburg. Yeah, I take your point about the correction of the pronunciation of his name. And I, I heard you snigger there in the back, Vickery. But remember, if, uh, if I'd said Peter Ndlovu... Uh, you're 100% right. And I, I, I remember the uh, bringing it up at the time and saying, you know, I did a lot of stuff on the, on the African service of the BBC. And, so, and they said, some lady at the... Uh, pronunciations department or some ridiculous department that you have there uh, had <laughs> had verified that it is in love. Yeah. It's in Glovo. It's 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 the it's the Zulu word for an elephant. Is an in Glovo. Yeah, that and that it's, that. It's a it's a sign of respect, and Dotson, given your tremendous singing prowess and your <laughs> and your status, you'd be Dotson and Glovo if you were in these parts. Uh, well, I should hope so. But well, that, that finding finding that out that that is the biggest round of applause. I yeah, can, I can give. I'm on one. my feet now. It will probably giving a round one. of applause yeah. for finding out that he's named after an elephant in Zulu. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> what, 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 other, no, what other show would you discover this kind of stuff on? The, the, the Zulu word for elephant is in global, so that's he's Peter Elephant. That's his name. Yeah. <laughs> hey, well, yeah, it works for a boy, maybe. It doesn't work as uh, well for a girl. Vickery you know. in Zulu, by the way, means um, um, cockney man with gold medallion on I his know. Head, chest. I know, I know. That is a perfect translation. <laughs> and I'll tell you who told me that. That was that lady on our translation unit that you so unceremoniously, <laughs> unceremoniously disparaged. He said exactly that. So it goes the to the Department show. of useless bureaucracy. <laughs> no, 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 no. Not at all. Suhail in Rio says, I just wonder... Can I, can I 
continue about the trial. It's like it's like Kevin De Bruyne. Kevin De Bruyne is it's the most simple. It's the most simple pronunciation possible, as in brain that you have inside your head or lack of in the BBC in the BBC pronunciation department. Yeah. It's not De Bruyne because there's yeah. an e on the end. Well, but some, see. every single commentator goes on about Kevin De Bruyne. You know, they try their utmost to well, destroy. Should sh- 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 I tell you why? I, I, the, the stick that I still get for saying things like Hamirez yeah. and Hulk. Or Ronald that's their, that's their, Yeah, well, that's their names for crying out loud. But there are people there in our, in our, in our beautiful but septic sometimes aisle who think that you're doing it as some kind of pose, you know, or you're trying to be clever. Um, it's, 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 it's almost but like I, institutionalized sorry, I'll, I'll... idiocy. It drives me mad. Yeah, although on that aspect I do agree with them, Tim, because I mean, Ronaldinho versus Ronaldinho is an accent um, rather than the, the the perfect pronunciation of the name. I mean, it's it's a bit sort of you could you could draw maybe a parallel with with American. You know, instead of saying Peyton Manning as one as one might on the BBC, we Peyton Manning. You know. Uh, to, to do it to do it the right way. So I, I'm, you know, your Ronald Gino, I understand, but um, the, the, you know, when it's it's Kevin De Brain. I mean, Brain, easy. Not yeah, De it, Bru- it's, uh. it's easy for you lot with your Afrikaans background, but for us, yeah. we, we need to anglicise everything. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense otherwise. You know, James Hernandez is James James. He's not James. You know, it can't work. Can't work, Tim, because when we look at that, we're seeing James, the King James Bible. It's not the King James Bible, is it? But you have you have learnt. I mean, everyone seemed to learn that uh, you know the Argentine forward who's on the bench for Leicester is Ushua, yeah, and that, yeah. that one seemed to go all right. That, yeah. that one seemed to do that. Yeah. Uh, and I heard um, commentators talking about Cathola. No, I, I can't actually do uh, Cathola. I couldn't do that one. You know, <laughs> I think that that uh, thought I thought a putty cat from. From mainland Spanish, uh, I, you know, I can't, just can't do that with a straight face. You know, luckily South American the Spanish, which I'm not very good at. Yeah. yeah, yes, yeah. Luckily, or in uh, um, you know South American Spanish, which I'm not very good at, doesn't do that. Doesn't do that thing all over the place. You know, I thought I thought I put it cat Cathola, but people seem to say Cathola and get away with it. But if, if, if I say Hamirez, then uh, I'm a I'm a sued and a fraud, and I'm trying to appear cleverer than I am, which is not difficult. Yeah, yeah. Have you always wanted to be that Disney character? Is it Disney cartoon character saying, "I thought I thought a perfect cat"? <laughs> well, it it's sounds a funny like cat. it's a double D. Uh, double oh, it's, it's a, thank you for the correction. You guys <laughs> had a misspent youth, unlike me. I was too busy le- reading the Encyclopedia Britannica from back to front. Anyway, <laughs> Suhail in Rio says, "I was just wondering if Tim thinks that this could finally be the year that Paulo Henrique Ganso comes good. He's looked to be in good form for San Paulo so far this season, and he got." More more goals in the Libertadores. I'd love to see him finally reach his true potential and put his injury problems behind him. He's such a classy player. Well, he is a classy player, um, but his game is, uh, is not really pass and move. It's kind of pass and stay quite still admiring the pass that he's just given. Uh, <laughs> that, dynamism. That, that, yeah, I was going to give you no, a standing you? ovation, but don't worry, you've already killed it. Go on. The, the, the dynamism that you need to play in his position at, at, at the top level of the game, I, just, I don't think he has. I think that's, that's a real problem for him. Uh, and, and when, he was, uh, when he was playing over here, Clarence Seedorf um, talked about this quite a lot. You know, he said, right, this is a player who's very talented, but you know, he, he, he plays in a position that in European football or in, in, in top-class football, that's where the marking is at its most, uh, at, its, at its tightest um, if he, I think, had he grown up in Europe, there would have been more chance of him being the kind of midfielder who operates from one penalty box to the other. Um, remember how, for example, and I, I never know if, I, if I'm pronouncing this name right, uh, Pirlo. Some people say Perlo. No, the, the the Italian who now plays in uh, in in yeah. The uh, Colonel Major says League Pirlo soccer. though, doesn't she? And um, you know, the Pirlo, yeah, and, uh, the Colonel is our translation expert on this one. And when he started, he played in that old style number ten position, you know, be behind the the centre forward, uh, where where Ganso now plays. Um, but 
it's difficult in modern day football to really shine there, especially if you're not the quickest. So he reinvented himself, dropping deeper, having the play in front of him, and, and you know, ju- judging the moment to move forward and make a contribution to the attack. But firstly, he's opening up the, the, the opposing defence with his quick passing from deep. And I think that that's the kind of role that Gansel, had he developed in Europe, I think that's where, that's where we, he would have been. Um, but at the time when he was a kid, Brazilian football wasn't looking for that kind of player. It had the mentality of, if, any, if you can play, if you've got any talent, you should be operating as close to the opposition goal as possible. Uh, and uh, I think um, it's, at the age he, he is now also, it, it's, it's going to be difficult for him to, um, to, to really go on and be the player that at one point Brazilian football was, was, was determined to, that, that he was going to be. I think one of the things he actually suffered from was an inflated reputation too early in his career. Uh, and he got the opinion, he, he decided it, because he was told he was a genius. I mean, it must be difficult to be 19 and 20 and, and have, have people surrounding you keep, keep telling you, you you're, you're a genius. I think it went to his head a little bit. Uh, he had those injury problems and he's now kind of mid-20s. Really he's going to be 26... <laughs> he's going to be 26 and you know you, you just wonder um, but my big question mark against him is I don't think he's ever going to be dynamic enough to be truly effective at the highest level yeah, Mark this one uh, from our listeners says please ask Mark who he thinks will be the first North African country to go furthest in the World Cup well we had Algeria into the um, group phase in Brazil and I think on current form and with current talent and, and the look of their squad I think they're going to be a, a good bet to maybe make the um, the quarterfinals in, in Russia but I would say Egypt you know Egypt event at the at the end of the day they sort of they're still the royalty of North African football and um, although they they have a wonderful they have a a rubbish World Cup record and haven't qualified since 1990. I think when they do make the breakthrough, they're going to do it in, in quite spectacular fashion. Morocco, too, are drawing these days on, on an incredible amount of talent in Europe uh, from the Moroccan diaspora. There's some really, really exciting players in the in the Moroccan squad, but they've, they haven't really done particularly well on the park over the last five years. They've got Hervé Renard as their coach now, who was um, one, he's won two of the last three Nations Cup, the uh, youngish Frenchman. Um, and they, he'll make his debut. They play the Cape Verde Islands in, the nation, in two Nations Cup qualifiers later this month. And the Cape Verde Islands, of course, are, according to FIFA, Africa's best team at the moment. So that's going to be a good test of, uh, of, of Morocco's potential. But I think if, um, if they do make it, Egypt, otherwise uh, steady old Algeria, I think they're also looking very good. It's exciting times for North African football at the moment. I wonder whether you think that a North African side and by that I mean a side from north of the Sahara or a side from south of the Sahara will get to the World Cup final first. I'm not saying win the World Cup, but which do you think will get to the World Cup final first? Yeah, that's a tough one. I mean I you know we all wait for the day and we've been wait you know, we wait every four years for the big African breakthrough and um Ghana was so close in uh in 2010 in South Africa to, to a semi-final place but it, it, it is the eternal African hope and I think at the end of the day we'll, we'll take anyone you know even if it was the Seychelles um, but um, you know I think I think in terms of, of depth of talent it would probably have to come from from south of the Sahara from uh, um, you know just North Africa North, when we talk North Africa in football in terms of basically speak about Arabic speaking Africa and I think there you're really just looking at uh, Egypt, Algeria and, um, and Morocco. Tunisia do qualify regularly for the World Cup but you know don't, I think, don't really have the talent pool to, to push on beyond the first round so out of one of those three so you, you've got to go more for a Cameroon or an Ivory Coast or a Nigeria or a Ghana to fly the flag as far as getting to the semis or the final is concerned in, in the future World Cup. But when that's going to happen, who knows? Lots of texts and emails I, about... I've, I've always thought, Mark, I've always thought with the... Um, this is obviously just a layman's opinion, but ever since Morocco in 86, the, the little doubt I've always had about the North African sides is I always think that maybe they can do more, but they, 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 they don't want to risk unless they really have to. I find them a little bit cautious. Is that fair? Yeah, and they yeah, and they always seem they always seem a little bit satisfied with uh, with just getting there and you know picking up a point here and uh, I mean when Morocco made it in '86 past the first round and I mean they pushed the Germans all the way but I mean they were deliriously happy with the fact that they'd um, 
you know, that they'd made it past the group phase. And, and um, the Algerians as well, now after Brazil, I mean, they went back to massive street celebrations in Algiers, basically making it through the first round and, and taking the Germans into extra time. I mean, that was a huge achievement for them. I suppose, you know, step by step, and let's not begrudge them uh, what is, at the end of the day, a wonderful achieve, achievement given um, their footballing history and how far they've come. But, but sometimes you do feel they sort of celebrate mediocrity a little bit too enthusiastically. I had lots of texts and emails about pronunciation uh, this morning. Um, apparently, there's a YouTube clip of Kevin De... How did you pronounce it, Mark? The Brain. Brain. The Brain. Inside your okay. head. Well, he says, this one of our listeners says, there's a YouTube video of Kevin himself saying De Bruyne. So he doesn't even know how to pronounce his own name, which is uh, unusual. Let's go and see the lady <laughs> in the BBC unit as well. Look, it's not unusual. It's not unusual. Um, I, I, I used to call myself Doton Adibeo. I didn't know how to pronounce my own name. James in Washington in Tyne and Ware uh, is with us. And, uh, James, you, we know that Tim Bickery does a good Geordie. I don't know if he can do a Tyne and Ware. Would you give us uh, an, uh, an exposition of how he should sound if he was to speak from your part? Um, I, I'm not very Geordie, so I pass on that one. That is a perfect Geordie <laughs> accent I heard just then via Lagos, Nigeria. But anyway, <laughs> James, good to have you with us. <laughs> I genuinely didn't know what accent you had. You know. for exactly. You. James, welcome to the programme. Go ahead. Um, hello, James. Uh, I just wanted to ask um, about um, a young man that plays for Liverpool. Um, I listen to BBC and also on the on the telly, and each time they pronounce his name, everybody keeps on going Jordan Ipe. And yes, uh, yes, we, that's I, a I, very good example. A of, that's a very good example. I did a bit of research on his background because the first time I saw that name, I thought, okay, this is somebody that maybe should be from Nigeria, and I know in Nigeria it's pronounced Ibe, and Ibe. I kept on hearing Ibe, Ibe, and. So I, I had a friend at work, and he's from Liverpool, and he said, no, that the young man said that's how it's pronounced. And I was a bit shocked. I was like, seriously? Um, so I don't know. Can anybody just give any explanation? <laughs> Mark can, because he's been on this one before, haven't you, Mark? Yes, I have. And, I, you know, obviously he wants to anglicise himself, or maybe he's a little embarrassed about... Uh... Uh, you know, or, or, or maybe I don't think it's that. I don't think as he's that. grown up. I suppose everyone's that's called him Ibens. That's and, it. And so, yeah, so that's that's what it's become. But I mean, you're 100. percent It's eBay. Embrace it. I mean, it's a you know. It's a you know, it's short. a difficult thing, you know. I mean, genuinely, I'm saying this, and you will know this, James, as well. It's a difficult thing because I grew up telling people my name is Dotton Adibayo, and I tell you, till today, people say Dotton Adibayo, especially people who I went to school with. They said to me, why did you change your name? I said, I never changed my name. But when you go into a class and the teacher, whatever you say decides to anglicise it. What can you do as an eight-year-old or as a nine-year-old or as a ten-year-old? And, and you just live with it afterwards it's not to do with being embarrassed about your background i don't think it's that it's just that you you kind of accept it because whatever you do you're not going to win and with a name like ibe you know you're not going to get anybody saying ebay over here unless you do like cone a from everton and you put an a there so you show them how to pronounce it do you know what i mean yeah definitely, definitely. i agree with that i, I think um for all the other young people that maybe have something close to it, because I was actually called something close to that traditionally from Nigeria. I don't have it now on my birth certificate, but I know I was called something like Delibe, and um, I, res I researched that as well. And there's a popular author called Delibe Onyama who was wrote quite a good book. So I see, I see the name as unique. And when I saw eBay, I was like, wow. Does but it, then I keep on saying, I. Does it I'm matter, like, though, that much? Mark to African players that their name are not been uh, their names are not been pronounced properly or any other players from any other country. Tim, does no, it matter no, to them? I, I I think that analogy that you've made about the eight year old kid in the in, in the classroom applies in a sense. I mean, there was the, there was the uh, ex Man City player Benjani Marawari who, who, who Marawaru who who came from Zimbabwe and when he arrived at Oxe initially. The coach Giru said, "I'm not pronouncing that name. You're Benjani," and he became Benjani. And 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 I thought it was a little bit, uh, you know, um, condescending in a sense of, you know, now they're calling him by his first name. There's no real culture in 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 this part of the world 
to have those sort of one, uh, you know, a, a first name Brazilian style, Lusophone style um, football monikers, like uh, you know, where they where they use part of your name and that becomes your footballing name. But he was called Benjani throughout his career, basically because the coach said, "Listen, I, you know, I can't pronounce that. I'm we calling you Benjani." But he did embrace it, and and he he made a bit of a marketing thing out of it eventually. And he, you know, Benjani is now Benjani. And when he went to, when he went to Man City, I would have thought you know would have sort of you know honor your father and your 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 family etc. Use your use your surname. But by that stage, it was so it was so well ingrained. He you know he just stayed he just stayed as Benjani. And I think there are many there are many uh, I, well there are a couple of cases like that with African footballers where the name has just been difficult for the marketing department and been difficult for other people. And, and so the African footballers have been somewhat accepting of. You know, of a change so that they fit seamlessly into the Western European market, and you can understand that. And 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 the analogy that you've given about the kid, I think, sort of fits into that perfectly. And it's not just the African footballers, is it, Tim? Um, from your side, you've told us about how James um, is it, James Rodriguez from. Um, he, does, he doesn't like it. He yeah, really I know, doesn't like I know, James. I know. You said. You said. You said. Why not? Why doesn't he like it? Well, because it's not his name, you know, and it's know, so. He, you know, it's, so he, he he makes a point. He makes a stand on it. Others don't. I think most of them don't mind. I mean, most of them, and, and this is something that happens to you if if you live in a different country with a different language. Your name can be pronounced differently. It's almost like having having two separate identities. Uh, and uh, I I think probably Ham is is an exception for for taking exception. I think most um, kind of accept that abroad the, the, the name is going to be pronounced differently and it, it's, it's not a big deal to them. Yeah, and James, for a fan, I suppose, if you can anglicise it, it helps when you've got to write a football chant, doesn't it? <laughs> well, um, I, I think that the talent show always stands, um, make him proud that he's talented and As... I think he should... Stand up for his name. Uh, yes, but it's not as, pronunciation. As we, say in, as we say in Nigeria, what does it matter? Ah, <laughs> he's such a good footballer. What does it matter if we call him Aib or Ibe? What does it matter? L let me tell you this joke that happened like last week at work. Um, I, I will, I've always, my, my surname is Ebere. It's, uh, um, I call it a lot of people say, um, call it wrongly. And yeah. I walked into this room where they had like seven people sitting, and they all were like happy to see me. And they were like, "Oh, James E B, Ibri," and I, and I laughed. And they were like, "Why are you laughing?" And I, I was like, "Well, for the last five years, you've been calling my surname wrong." Yeah. And their faces went red. And I was like, hey. "Well, at, at <laughs> least they didn't. That. At least they didn't call you had a biro." Dotson uh, had a biro. <laughs> or like one of my managers that called me James um, um, Beer because he couldn't call oh. it Beer. And, and, and the best one was when I went to his shop to buy something in North London and Adebayo was playing for Arsenal and I started spelling my name as I'd been doing for the last 50 years in this country. I, said, oh, I know how to spell Adebayo. It's got an R at the end, isn't it? I said, no, no, that's the wrong bloke. Anyway, James, it's been fun. When, when, when are we going to meet like this again? <laughs> I don't think anytime soon because this my No, because I like to talk with my Nigerian accent. You know that. Come on, James, give me a call. 0500 909 -693. 0500 909 693. We're talking football in Africa and South American players from over there playing in our leagues. And thanks to James in time and where the discussion by text, emails, and on Twitter is all about pronunciation of footballing names, particularly African names. You'll be pleased to know Mark. Mark Leeson, our Springbok Junior, is with us in Cape Town, taking care of any questions you might have on African football. The legendino Tim Vickery is in Rio answering any questions you've got on South American football and players from over there playing in our leagues. <clears throat> this one from Sam uh, for you, Mark. Um, <laughs> he says, uh, African footballers' names, examples, Fred Friday... Danger fourpence, Christ Bongo. Any more? Um, Chris Bongo played for the Congo. I remember him. I haven't heard of the <laughs> of the of the first two, but yeah, I mean, um, you know, those kind of uh, 
patronising examples of ridiculousness are there here and there. Mm-hmm. But, um, you know, that's the guy's name. Um, and... Uh, I know, I know, yeah. I, I know it's the guy's name. But it, I mean, even over here, when you have a name like Georgie Best, you expect him to be the best. And, you know, you, you, you play on that a little bit. You know, Clyde Best, you're not quite the best, Clyde, but Georgie is the best. Clyde you know, was the best. He was the best from Bermuda, if I remember correctly. Yeah, 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 to that respect. But I was just thinking in um, the English first division as it was then, Georgie Best had to be best. It couldn't be called Georgie Best and be the worst, if you see what I mean. And, you know... It's only a little bit of fun, isn't it? Do you, do you think it's disparaging or disrespectful of the footballers? No, I, you know, I just think, uh, I mean, danger sixpence, uh, you know, that's... Uh, it was fourpence, I think. Was it four? Yeah, I, I, I must say, I've never heard of it. No that's inflation yeah. for you. <laughs> I was thinking it would have been better if it was sixpence. But anyway, apparently there is a footballer called Danger Fourpence and uh, I don't know who he played for. But thanks for telling us that Chris Bongo played for the Congo. Yeah, yeah, I saw him play, Chris Bongo, but he's, you know, uh, he's not Christ Bongo. No, no, apologies. Apologies. And I think Chris Chris was probably shortened from Christoph. Yeah, yeah. Well, that makes sense now. But the fact that he played for Congo and his name was Bongo kind of just <laughs> produces a smile. It's, it's not disparaging. I'm sure he's a great player, but it does produce a smile. What about this one? Tony in Liverpool says, can you ask Tim how he pronounces the name of Chelsea player currently on loan to Juventus, Juan Cuadrado? Does he put a pause twixt his first name and surname, or does he, like the Five Live commentary team last Wednesday, say it as one word, which had me giggling like a 12-year-old? Well, usually... Juans, they don't like being Juans, so that they'll they'll use the kind of second name. So he's Juan Guillermo Cuadrado, like Riquelme. Riquelme is a Juan. He didn't want to be a Juan. He wanted to be a Roman. So he was Juan Roman Riquelme. You know, kind of Juan. I think is seen is seen as a little bit ten a penny. So you don't want to be Juan. You want to be that second name. Yeah, you don't want to be the Juan. You want to be. Well, anyway, I tried, didn't I? It wasn't even worth a giggle. Um, OK, lots more to talk about. 0500 909 693. This is for you, Mark, um, from Chopra, who says, why geopolitically have we seen an emergency of quality Ivorian and Ghanaian footballers recently? I, I, I don't know if I could answer that properly in, 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 in the causes. I do, th- I do think these things sort of go around in, in, in stages and circles. I think, you know, we've had uh, from from that from that area um, geopolitically, ironically, not that much stability in the Ivory Coast at, at the same time as they were, were really coming to the fore, but on the back of a, of a very exciting generation of footballers, you know, um, and perhaps a, a, a much improved academy system through which the likes of Yaya Toure, etc., came through, but then, you know, Didier Drogba, who was a big element of that, was um, was basically raised in France and uh, probably has um, the French school of football. Um, to, uh, Ivory Coast has, has the French to thank for for Drogba's prowess, um, and and Ghana has been, you know, Ghana's a very stable place, but always has been, and uh, it, it, you know, it's a it's a wonderful country that really works well. But then, uh, you know, you had a glorious period for Nigeria in in the 90s when geopolitically Nigeria wasn't all that stable either. So, I, you know, I, I don't know if, if they emerge because of those reasons or why they emerge because of those reasons. I, I think these things all work in, in, in cycles and we, we're probably going to see a little period of of North African dominance now in, in, the, in the African game, maybe over the next five or six years, if you look on paper at the quality of of the squads and players that they have available, and wouldn't that be fairly ironic at a time when, you know, uh, geopolitically, it's uh, things are not uh, as steady as mm. they once were in Egypt, Algeria, Morocco, etc. Oh, indeed, in the Ivory Coast, as we know from the terrorist attacks there last week. But interesting—that's oh, that's a good point. Yes, interesting that our listener has chosen one country from, you know, Francophone Africa and the other from Anglophone. Well, they—I Afri- na- mean, they're neighbours too, and in, in, you know, and. Um, but but Ghana has had very little. I mean, they had a whole civil uh, strife in in in, in uh, the Ivory Coast, really, when the football team was, was was beginning to emerge. And you you know, Didier Drogba played that massive role in uh, in helping ease the tensions. And that was basically uh, fairly much a, a ethnic religious thing uh, between the sort of Muslim dominated North and the Christian dominated South. And uh, 
you know, echoes of that are still sort of streaming through society uh, in the Ivory Coast. But um, at the same time, the football team is doing better than it ever did before. But isn't it interesting, though, when we talk about the Ivory Coast, we saw from last week's intervention by France, for example, after the terrorist attack, at least to make itself available to send troops to help the Ivorians out in their in their battle against terrorist attacks. We, we, we saw that that connection between what was the former colonial masters is still quite strong in Francophone Africa. Very much so. And, and I mean, they've got bases all over the place, the French. So, you know, to move those reaction forces into, into position is, is a fairly easy task for them. Um, and, and we their, know and their, we, their connections with their with their former colonies yeah. are, are much stronger than the Anglo ones. And, and we know, don't we, that there is a much stronger line uh, between those francophone countries in Africa to France or the French leagues when it comes to football than there there would be for the anglophone countries. I just wonder whether there's an answer in terms of well, Ivorian players are more likely to get into the French leagues a lot quicker, and whether that develops them playing in an international field, and that develops ultimately the national team. Is there an argument that could be made in that way that can't be made for Ghana, for example? Yeah, in, in theory, but in practice it hasn't really happened because the irony of, of the of the ASEC Abidjan uh, Academy, which is the mass producer of all of this talent, Solomon Kalu, the, the Toure brothers, etc., etc., uh, Aruna Dindan was p- perhaps their, their most famous graduate when they, when they first made their name, was that they all went through Belgium. Um, there was a there was a, a Belgian connection because it was easy and it's still easy um, to park your players in Belgium and to get them a, an EU passport. It, it, it works a lot quicker in Belgium than anywhere else, and that's why that's why the connection. So they actually, if you look at the careers of um, of of many of these top Ivorian players, there is very little French influence. There is some French influence in that uh, in that. Yayo spent some time in Monaco and Kalu did well in Lille, etc. But um, the, there isn't as much as one would assume with, with the colonial connection. But Senegal, on the other hand, who have a very good-looking squad too, have a massive, you know, most of those players are, 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 are French-born or French-raised. Uh, and if they're not, they are certainly went across to France at a very, at a very, you know, as a teenager and, and had their footballing skills developed even more. So there, they certainly benefit from it much more than, uh, than I suppose the example that, that you're hinting at is you take a young Nigerian, he's, you know, there's no fast track to Tranmere Rovers for him, but a young Senegalese, there's probably a fairly fast track to Lance or Le Havre or wherever, mm-hmm. where, where, you know, a and, team of a similar ilk. So it, uh, it is a good point that you're uh, making there. And ironically, the fast track for the Nigerian player is probably through the French route as well to come to Europe, isn't it? Ironically, you've got all these yeah. Anglophone African players playing in the French leagues or other European leagues before they, they even make it to the country, you know, quote unquote, was the motherland. Yes, yes. And and, and, there, and there's some good examples of players. And, and, and also, I mean, if you look at the the most outstanding Nigerians in the European Forum over the last 20 years. Okocha was the Bundesliga. Olise was all over the place. Um, but, you know, he started off in Belgium. Belgium, I think, has been a great conduit for Nigerian talent. And increasingly, uh, Eastern Europe. I mean, Ahmed Musa, Shiska Moscow, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, there, there is... Um, well, look, there's a Nigerian footballer everywhere, but, 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 you, but that's completely correct with what you're saying, is that they... That they they usually head elsewhere in Europe before they land up in the Premier League. Michael in Kentucky wants to know, uh, Tim, whether South American teams South American teams benefit by playing the Mexican teams in the Copa Libertadores, which of course is the South American Champions League. Does the quality of those teams, uh, the the Mexican teams, raise the level of play or expose them to better tactics and ultimately raise the love, level of play that way? Well, and the main thing it does is expose them to a massive TV audience, and that's why the Mexicans are invited. It's all about that folding stuff. Um, but the Mexican teams on a financial level uh, are very good relative to the South American. So you'll you find that the Mexican teams are full of South American talent. They're also quite often um, good tactically, and they're usually good to watch as well. I think the problem that the Mexican teams often have is that the, 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 the knockout stages of the Libertadores they will tend to coincide with the playoff stage in the Mexican Championship, which means that if, if the Mexican club is fighting on both fronts, if it's still in with a chance of winning the, winning the 
league title, and it's in the Libertadores. They're caught, they can be caught up in an absurd fixture pile-up at, at times. Um, another thing that they do is they, uh, they force the, the South American teams into massive, massive travelling time. Obviously, that, that works both ways because when they travel down, they, they have to go a long, long way down as well. A lot of people don't realise how big the Americas are, and it's, 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 a, it's a stat that I've wheeled out on a number of occasions because a lot of people over, over in England seem to think that Mexico is in South America. It's not really even central. It's North America. So the distance between, say, Buenos Aires and Mexico City is further than the distance between London and a number of cities in India. It's a long, long way. It's a different hemisphere. You know, we're, we've, uh, we're just coming out now of high summer in South America. When the teams have gone up to Mexico, it's a long, long journey into the into the depths of winter. Oh. So it's a lot of traveling. It's you a wait, lot of traveling time. You wait till President Trump has his way. Mexico will no longer be in North America. I assure you, <laughs> it'll be very well in South America. There'll be a long line separating North. America. America from Mexico, I can tell well, you that. Uh, w- what it's going to be interesting to see in the future is is whether there is uh, some kind of Pan American Championship for clubs. Um, there, there is some money behind this already behind behind this idea, because you know the the, the, the US idea, is MLS the money still there in uh, Concacaf and Conmebol. Well, the money would be coming from TV companies. Um, and, and the money would be very, very attractive to, uh, to, to uh, um, both CONCACAF and Comnibol, I think, although there are administrative problems there. Um, it's a kind of natural mix, a natural fit, because the MLS, the teams kind of have this momentum that they've, they've developed fan bases and so on. But they don't have the tradition. They're lacking in that a little bit still. Whereas the South Americans, they've got tradition to burn. You know, they've got loads of tradition, but they haven't got the money and they haven't got that positive momentum going. So you can see that as a nice little mix of the South Americans and the North Americans. They're each giving something to each other. But the thing that mitigates against it is the traveling. The traveling time would just be insane, which is why I think a more feasible solution would be a tournament, you know, played every year or, or, or every other year, um, bringing, say, the four best teams from South America, from our Copa Libertadores, with the four best teams from the CONCACAF Champions League. That way, each region, each region um, protects its own identity and you still get the benefit of this joint competition. So that, that's what I would like to see in the future, I think. You know what you were saying uh, a few minutes back? Sorry, Mark, did I interrupt you? Go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to ask him a question about about the Mexican participation because I saw that in the CONCACAF Champions League semifinals there are four Mexican clubs. Now, are you allowed to... Are they the same clubs who are competing in Copa Libertadores or are they a different set of Mexican sides? Because if they are, then in effect you've got two chances to go to the Club World Cup, which is a little unfair. Wrong. Wrong, you haven't, because okay. uh, Mexico so if a Mexican is not side in... wins Copa Libertadores, they don't go as South American representatives. Correct, that's right, yeah. Um, twice Mexican sides, have, or three times now, Mexican sides have reached the final. They've never won it. But if they, if they were to win the Libertadores, you're right. The, the, the losing team from South America would, uh, would represent the continent in, uh, in, in the Club World Cup. And it, it is different teams. Um, so um, the best Mexican teams aren't even in the Libertadores usually because they're in the, in, in the CONCACAF Champions League. Oh, do they pick that one oh, because, of, because they obviously get the chance to go to the Club World Cup? Exactly. All oh, right. Right. Well, round of applause. Thanks, Tim. Yeah, no, he hasn't added a round of applause yet. I've asked listeners to text us an 85058 when he deserves a round of applause, or you indeed, Mark, but neither of you had a round of applause just yet, so you've got to work harder. Another 40 minutes or so of the programme to redeem yourselves. Remember what you were saying a moment ago, Tim, about you being the quiet defender, quietly doing your work, not getting the plaudits of the striker. Well, Tom in Luton wants to tell you about somebody just like that. Tom, good morning. Good morning, how are you? Yeah, very well, thanks very much. So we're talking about somebody who is in midfield, defensive midfield, quietly doing his job, not getting the plaudits of Jamie Vardy and the like, banging in the <laughs> goals, but nevertheless perhaps the most influential player for Leicester this I, season. I, th- I think he's getting his plaudits now, eventually. Um, but yeah, it just ties in with what you were saying a few minutes ago. Um, and Golo Conte, obviously, a m- massive player, a lot of... A lot of pundits have come out and said uh, could be player of the year this year um, are basically for Mark are, are Marley you know a little bit disappointed was he on their radar to play very for much them? so 
very much so. And there, there's a there's a fascinating battle going on at the moment between several European countries, and France and Holland are the, are the two that's come to mind, um, and North African countries and and West African countries around some of the more exciting talent that has emerged over the last um, six to nine months. And it's interesting how it's interesting how France are going to use him. Um, because these are these are friendly matches that they're playing. They're playing. I think they're playing the Dutch, and then I'm not sure who they're playing on the Tuesday thereafter. But even if Kante plays for France, he's still eligible under the FIFA rules to play for Mali because these are non-competitive internationals. They have to use him in the European Championships in some form to get him tied down. Um, but there is now there is really now the temptation, and the Dutch did this with El Ghazi, the very exciting Moroccan uh, Dutch born of Moroccan descent player, uh, the striker for Ajax Amsterdam. They used him last year towards the end of the European Championship and gave him a couple of minutes because the Moroccans have been breathing down his neck, offering him inducements, etc, to come and play for them and it's, it, it goes on and on almost month by month now in Africa is you know a, a young African talent gets um, uh, or, or a young, let me put it this way, a European-born or European-raised talent um, with, with the possibility of dual nationality gets approached by by the Africans in particular because they're looking for those kind of players. I mean, they're ready-made, they're talented, they're playing uh, in, in the top leagues in Europe and they would be, and they're all great assets for, for African national sides. Um, and I think the Europeans are getting, you know, really irritated by it now. Um, so there's a. It's fascinating to see, you know, who goes where and who decides on. And it's it must be very difficult for those players too. The emotional pull of family versus, the, you know, the practical sense perhaps of, you know, the and, and the influence of club. Um, but Mali are very disappointed about not getting Kante. But I think they gave up the fight a couple of weeks ago now because uh, they, they announced their squad the day before the French did, and, and he interestingly wasn't in it. And I, and I thought they would name him anyway just to sort of make the point <laughs> and to leave the door open, but they didn't. But Tom, so, uh, on, yeah, on, good, the, on the other hand, sorry, um, obviously Mares was playing nowhere near the level that he is now. That, that's the yes. coup for Algeria to have yes. Mares rather than him playing for France. Yes, well, it, 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 it's a it's an answer that you probably never an honest answer you would never get from him in, in a public forum. But Mares was I, I hesitate to use the word nothing, but he was certainly was not on the radar um, yeah. internationally in the way he is now when the Algerians first spotted him, and he would have been delighted at that stage. I'm, I'm making a presumption now, but he, you know he would have been a French first. French League One, League Two player, the Algerians was said, come and play for us. You're, you know, you're obviously Algerian. He has a passport, um, uh, and, and his international career was well underway before he, you know, before he signed for for Leicester. And he was a bit of a, a nothing signing when, initially when he went to Leicester. But and he's now become a world star. And he, he probably he probably does have a moment or two when he sits down and thinks to himself, you know what, if I'd been patient. Um, okay. I, I might have eventually paid for France, and maybe you know that might have been an ambition of his. It might not. He might not have ever wanted to play for France. You're never really going to get a straight answer on that from him. I, I fancy that there are a couple of these players who, who make that call early on in their career, and then think, "Oh, you know, I could have maybe played um, for, for the country where I was born rather than the country from where my parents come from." But it's it's you know once you play a competitive international it's too late and I think in a sense playing for Algeria has helped Mares become the Mares that he is today so he's got a little bit to, you know he's got he's got so he's got to be grateful for for having made that decision. It's a conundrum for the players, but don't those national teams have to spot those players from an early age to compete no. the smaller national teams in the same way that Wales does. That's why Ryan Giggs played for Wales. You know, that's no, why... No, but that was, in a diff- that was in a different era. You don't have to really spot them. Uh, I mean, the, the latest one is Lamine Conte, the, the, or Kone, the uh, Senegal def- uh, defender. He's a, you know, he played for France under 17, under 18, under 21. Nowadays, uh, and, and a guy like that at the age of 20, 19 is on, is on the trajectory to play for the French national side. But... You know, now in his mid twenties, he he's faded from you know possible selection, and the Ivorians come along and say, "Listen, don't you want to come and play for us?" And they really just have to fill in a form, get the permission of the French, send it to FIFA to say, uh, "May we please request a change of nationality?" You can do it only once, so you can't go back again. And uh, Corne will play 
uh, everything working out fine. He will play in the next couple of days for the very first time for the Ivory Coast against Sudan. And he will be forevermore now tied to the Ivory Coast because these are competitive Nations Cup qualifiers over the next couple of weeks. Uh, and um, he's basically emerged fairly late in his, in his career. So uh, with the change of law where uh, if you play junior football, you're, you're not bound uh, as it used to be. Um, it's a lot easier now for the African size. You can, you can, uh, for African countries, you can wait but and, then, but and then see Mali, how play develops. The, the Mali should have spotted Conte. And Tom, the great news is that Mark hasn't corrected us on the pronunciation of Conte, so we can <laughs> we can stick to that. But Mali, the reason why you, you can't feel sorry for Mali, they should have picked up Conte a long time ago before the French did. Or is it? Is it? Did Conte change when he came to Leicester in the same way that Mahrez has, Tom? Yeah, I think he, he, there are Mahrez-esque um, parallels with him too, you know. And and you know, he might not, Mali might have been happy with what they had, and Mali might have thought that they had better players than 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 Conte at yeah. the time. Well, I so do, I, I don't know how true it is, but there were there were stories that um, Mar, uh, sorry, Conte had been spotted and scouted by European giants. And uh, there was one this week that Real Madrid didn't want to sign him because he wasn't a big-name player. How true that is, I don't know. But he must have been on Mali's radar before that. So what, why hadn't they you know, picked him up? Why, but, I mean, he wasn't... He, you know, Ma- the, the Malian defence is made up usually of, you know, really good players from League One in, uh, in France or the Bundesliga or... or, or, or Spanish Primera Division clubs. So, you know, where was Kante before he, he joined Leicester? You know, he, he certainly wasn't a name before this season. So he has well, really he just was, emerged. He was, at, uh, he was at Cannes last year, wasn't he? And I believe he was he was up there in the stats again like he is this year, you know, top tackler, top interceptor and everything like that. Maybe, maybe he was hanging on for France. I, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, there is that, there is that possibility too. But I, I would suggest that he, you know, that... Um, there is the very strong possibility they didn't pick him because um, he was a little bit down the pecking order, and now he's uh, he's had the most fabulous of seasons, and he's gone up the pecking order, and he's become the subject of a little bit of a tug of war. And it's and it's it's interesting how the French, who I think are, are the most irritated of the lot, have moved very quickly to to uh, obviously convince him to play. And I'm sure now that they're, they're not going to they're not going to muck about either. They're going to give him game time, uh, and. You know, as soon as they possibly can, they're going to give him competitive game time, which is either in the European Championships or when the World Cup qualifiers start in uh, in, in September in in Europe. Listen, mate. we've got a similar case in 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 South America. In fact, a Premier League player, uh, Juan Manuel Iturbi of Bournemouth, who arrived in January as a as an Argentine and is now Paraguayan. Um, and this the, he's this is another case of a Juan who doesn't want to be a Juan. He's Juan Manuel. <laughs> uh, and he was born in Argentina. There, there, are, there are a lot of, um, there's a big Paraguayan population in Argentina, usually at the, at the, the lowest end of the social scale. Uh, and uh, shortly after he was born, his parents, who were Paraguayan, moved back to Paraguay, and he grew up in Paraguay. It was apparent that he was something special. So Paraguay picked him for their national team at the age of 16. But because it was only a friendly, that, that didn't actually mean anything. And then, and then he jumped ship and he played for Argentina at under-20 level. Um, and I think he wanted to be Argentine then. A few years down the line, his career hasn't gone the way that he expected. And he was built up as a kind of another Messi. Uh, he's looked at the Argentina squad and I think, well, I'm not going to get in there. Uh, yeah. He's not getting a game for Bournemouth. Um, you, you know what? I think I'll be Paraguayan now. So, and he's, he, he put it on Facebook or something. He put this heartfelt message of, I'm really sorry for if I've upset anyone, I've always been torn between these two countries, but from now on, I'm prepared to sweat every last bucket, every last, every last drop for, for Paraguay. And he's in their squad for the World Cup qualifiers. Yeah, Tom, thanks a lot for setting up this debate. A very fascinating one, actually. I'm sure we'll get lots of response on that as well. But, uh, Mark, how about Roger Christmas? I think he was uh, a sub. This is from Andrew Manchester. I think he was a sub in the same squad as Roger Miller for Cameroon. Mispronounced pronunciations he used to drive me crackers when Jan Mielby signed for Liverpool and all the commentators vied with each other to find the most bizarre pronunciation of his name Molbu Malbo etc etc they should have just come to me Mielby easy easy as that and I suppose it's like you know the the, the one that irritates me the most is Dirk, is Dirk Kate yeah. um, 
D- D- Dirt Kite. Dirt Kite. No, yeah. not Kite. He's not, yeah, it's Kate. Dirt, yeah, no, to you as it's in, Kate. As in, Look. As in the Duchess of whatever she is, <laughs> yeah, it's so <laughs> simple for the English tongue. Just, but just. it's Afrikaans. I keep telling you that we yeah. speak English over here. You know, all those children rioted in Ace Soweto. Just those, th- th- two. those children rioted in Soweto so that they didn't have to learn Afrikaans. Can we not have a break here? Do we have to learn Afrikaans when we're trying to speak English? <laughs> I'm sorry I had to bring that up. 0500 909 Got another half an hour of this world football phoning to go. I promise you, we will not bring up any other apartheid history between now and four o'clock. Unless we have to, of Sanctions. course. Sanctions. <laughs> Sanctions now. 0500 As ever, we talk South American football with the legend Edo Tim Vickery in Rio and players from over there playing in our leagues and we've got our regular guests uh, from Africa the oracle of African football with us Mark Gleeson who is our Springbok junior in Cape Town taking care of any questions you've got on African football and players from over there playing in our leagues we've got some questions for a Brenda not sure what that's about maybe we'll come back to that in a moment or two Tim, do you, do you know what that's about? Anyway, we'll no, come back no to idea. it. I, know, I didn't think you would. But we'll come back I'm still to getting it. the phone calls. Yeah, I'm still getting yeah, them. Yeah, from. Yeah, they start yeah. every day, 8.45 in the morning. Yeah. Uh, Brenda Floyd is Santana. No, it ain't me. Yeah. Stop. Yeah, yeah. But they won't. Well, and still they come. How do they all find me? I don't know. It's, it's gone on Twitter. It's gone around the world on Twitter. You know how They're these things medallion. are. Exactly. Look for the shining gold medallion. This from our listener. Love the show. Haven't missed an episode since I discovered the podcast in 2007. My question is for Tim. It's about the Venezuelan League in the USA. We've just started receiving these games on TV and I was hoping Tim could give us some more details on them. Who are the big teams? How's the quality? Also, I've noticed multiple all-female officiating crews, which is great. Is this common? Well, Venezuela, their, um, their women's football team is also developing. Um, so it, it, is, it is becoming more common, I think, which, which is good to see. Um, the Venezuelan League, and Venezuela is, is, is the country in South America where football was slowest to take off. You know, culturally, this is quite funny given the political situation, but culturally very much in the orb of, of the United States. So it's, uh, it, it's sporting, in sporting wise, and baseball has, has always been the, 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 the main sport. I, I love the way they, they, they write about a home run. They call it a, a, a hon run. J O N R O N, hon run. That's, a, that, that's the way that they've, they've, they've kind of Spanishized home run. I suppose so you're going to want us to pronounce it like that from now on, do you? No, no, no. Okay. It's, a, it's, it's, it's a home run, apparently. Yeah. Um, not, not that I know, I know very much about baseball. If you build it, they will come. Um, and uh, well, if. If Venezuela tried to uh, to implant a football culture, um, it staged the Copa America in 2007. The national team had already started winning some games. They'd always been just making up the numbers, but they'd started winning some games, and it, it had enthused people. And the Venezuelan league was traditionally, I think, more about immigrant communities. You know, a, a Portuguese team or an Italian team or a Spanish team, something like that. But in recent years, it's gone well beyond that, and it, it now. Has has it now vies with baseball to to be the number one sport but it's got all the problems of launching a league in the globalized era um, in that the thing that was the driver for the popularity of Venezuelan football was the national team what happened with the with the relative success of the national team those players were in the shop window and they were sold abroad Um, with the with the result that the quality of the of the, the domestic league plummets at the very time when you're investing in it and trying to, to, to make it good. And you've really seen this in, in the Libertadores South America's Champions League. And the last time that a Venezuelan team qualified for the knockout phase was, I think, in 2009. You know, uh, uh, since then, every year, all of their teams have been eliminated in the group phase. There's a possibility that might not happen this year. Deportivo Táchira, um, are, as, it, as it stands... They're in, in one, of the, one of the qualification positions. Um, Tachira are, are one of the more traditional sides in Venezuelan football because they're over nearer the Colombian border. And that's the place where historically football has been stronger. Obviously, there's some kind of cultural links with, uh, with, um, with, with Colombia. In fact, I think that the, the fellow who was uh, recently retired from the national team, but he's still playing club football in Mexico, Juan Arango, uh, one of the reasons that he was so good was that he's the son of Colombian parents. So he grew up very, very much with,
with football. I think the, the new generation are now growing up with football, whatever their background. Um, but the, the quality, I think, is, 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 not, is not particularly good because it's suffered from this, this globalised era. The success of the national team has meant that there are more Venezuelan players than ever before making a living abroad. And that means that the quality of, of, uh, of domestic Venezuelan football has gone. And I watched Tachada last night and there was a, a Uruguayan centre-back who was briefly at West Brom. I don't know if West, West Brom fans remember him. Williams Martinez, he was there. He had an absolute mare. So uh, they're importing foreigners kind of at the end of their career and so on. So uh, it's difficult for Venezuelan football to really establish itself because it's so hard to launch a league these days in the globalised era. And you finally got a standing ovation, Tim. Um, this is from George who says, I applaud Tim Vickery for his informative, funny and professional contributions to the show. I think Dotton's lighter style would be more at home on Radio 2 or Radio Norwich. <laughs> I've got just... You laughed, do you? OK. I've just... I've got just... Oh, I've oh just, Gleason, that means, that no, means you're no, going to get bullied no, for the no, remaining 17 no, minutes. No, 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 I don't bully. You know me, I don't bully. <laughs> I've got just one thing to say about that. I am the one and only... <laughs> Well, OK, I think we've made the joke now. We don't need to hear the whole tune, you know. No, Chesney, please, Chesney. The new Chesney. policy of playing the music rather than singing it, could we keep it up? <laughs> I, I can keep you up. I can keep you up. You know that I was made for that game, so any time. Yeah, uh, you'll never hear me sing again, I promise you. Well, at least not tonight. I can guarantee you that. This one for you, uh, well, it's for both of you, really. Who are the best African and South American managers likely to be available this summer? As, as a Man United fan, I feel like a top job will be open soon. Uh, so who from your region first, Mark, would take, could take that top job? Anybody? Well, the top managers on the continent show are mostly... Uh, expatriates and uh, I mean if you're looking for the a new exciting talent that you know in in the sort of uh, or, or, or or a maverick talent and maybe in a Bielsa kind of category you've got to look at South America Africa has never been an exporter of managers we've never actually had an African manager a real African manager and by real I mean brought up on the continent and and worked on the continent and earned his spurs on the continent go across and uh, and 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 take a job at any level uh, any professional level in in Europe, there are a few now um, managers with um, of African descent. The, the, probably the most successful has been um, Lito Vidigal in Portugal, who's done a couple of the sort of um, uh, Premier League clubs there. He's a, he's an ex Angolan international, but br brought up in Portugal of Angolan parents. Mm. Um, and you know, we do do follow his progress because he, you know, hopefully he might open the door for. Uh, for that, for other former African internationals, but in the true sense of an export from you know African football to Europe and bringing something something fresh from from this continent, the, 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 you know, we're still waiting for the first man to make his move across. So why is that? that? Why is that? I mean, on, on what level well, would think, you say? You know, I think Africa has a, a long history of being taught rather than teaching. You know, uh, on a football level, and most of the top jobs on this continent still go to expatriate managers. So when you're not developing your own managerial and coaching talent, um, you're not going to be able to teach the world much. But the, the uh, African footballers who are, have, in, in your words, been brought up in Africa and trained and played and experienced and managed in Africa, what level would you say they were on in comparison to the English leagues? I know when um, Sean Wheelock used to uh, be part of the team, he was always getting questions on where he thinks Major League Soccer would fit into the English leagues. And he would always say, well, it's probably championship. And everybody would scoff with laughter, thinking, ah, oh, that's a bit of an exaggeration. But where, where would you say that the level of African managers, those that are brought up and have done their, 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 their yeah. you know, pay their dues in Africa, what level would you say that they were in the best level that they could be in in, in the English league, do you think? Well, I, I think that completely uh, depends on the individual, but, but there have been very few who have been given opportunity. And if you look particularly across the ranks of Africans who've gone across to Europe in their playing days and become um, great footballing stars... Almost none of them have made the transition to coach. You know, Abedi Pele, George Weir, 
Um, only recently, Sunday Elisa has got the job as um, as Nigerian coach. He lasted six months in the in in, in the position. He's out now. Uh, JJ Okocha, etc. None of them have really gone back into any sort of managerial role. It's not something that the modern day successful African footballer does. It's almost as if it's beneath his sort of standing. Uh, I think I might be being a little unfair there, but. There are very few of them who, who continue in the game and, and come back onto the continent and, and coach at the you know in their local league and, and try and um, make their name you know try and do the same process again in the coaching ranks. So, but but the bottom line is that the best jobs in Africa are taken by imported coaches, and that's why we're we're not producing anyone. You know. How about in South America, Tim Keyspot? Anybody there who could do the Man United job? Well, Manuel, Manuel Pellegrini is going to be free, isn't he? Um, would they take him? <laughs> no, I mean, the, uh, the, the sensible answer would be um, Jorge Sampaoli, the, uh, the Argentine who until recently was the coach of Chile, who is, is being lined up for a major European job. And he talked to Chelsea, and he could have taken the Chelsea job, I think. But they wanted him straight away, and, and he said that his English just wasn't good enough. And he's, he's, he's been studying. And he, he, he pulled out of the, the Chile job at the start of the year, and he's, he's been studying English. Uh, and why I would like him for United is that I think that you know, clubs have an identity. They have a collective identity. And one of the reasons that another South American coach, Simeone, is so successful with Atletico Madrid is that he, he understands the identity of that club, and he played there, and he lived it, and he breathed it. And, you know, United, they've got to have something of that swagger about them. And I think they've lost this a little bit recently. Uh, and one of my favourite football books is, is Bobby Charlton. Uh, he's, he's, he's done one autobiography on England and one on, on his time at Manchester United. And the, the United one, they're both good, but the United one is great. And he, he talks about how Matt Busby, who was the, the, the manager at the time, really instilled in, in them the idea that, you know, you're representing the world's first industrial city. It, it's, it's a dreary city in some ways. It's a hard-working city. It's a city where... The, the mission of the club is to provide some colour. So you want some swagger from, from United. And I think maybe they've lost a little bit of that recently. And, and Sampaoli, his football, comes with a swagger. He, he wants to attack. He wants to play in your half of the field. He'll throw men forward. It's great to watch. So I think he would be, he would be a good fit for, for uh, I, 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 I dread to say it, for, for, for the Manchester United brand. Colin is asking whether either of you chaps have a sporting hero outside of football that perhaps could inform football or footballers. Mark? Um, not, I'll tell you who I really liked as a kid was Clive Rice, the cricketer. But I, how he informs and impacts on football, I find it very hard to find the, um, the connection. Tim? Ali, Muhammad Ali. I, I was born the day that he fought for the first time as Muhammad Ali, and he won the title as Cassius Clay against Sonny Liston. And then the rematch um, was uh, was the day I was born, and, and then by then he'd become Muhammad Ali. And uh, what I think he's, he he has to teach top level footballers is the relative importance of things, because the the gesture of of Ali um, to give up everything that he'd worked for. Um, uh, in, in order not to go and fight the Vietnam War because he didn't think it was a just war. Uh, you think about that decision at the time it was taken, and he lost everything. Um, in retrospect, he comes across as a great man, but we're looking at that 50 year, you know, nearly 50 years later. The courage needed to take that decision at the time, I think, was absolutely magnificent. Um, because he was really, really criticised for it. Uh, and so uh, I think someone like that who'd lived for boxing but realised at that moment that there was something more important at stake, I think that's a, that, that's a wonderful lesson. I'll be travelling through South America for the next year, says Simon, and we'll be looking to see as much live football as possible. Which team stadiums does Tim recommend to go to watch a game, best atmosphere, etc. You always get asked this one, and I know that we'll start off in Argentina, will we? It's Travel travelogue, well, it's a weekly insert. Yeah, exactly, yeah. yeah. And any game in Argentina, really. And the, the trouble with... and people say Some people say Boca is overrated. I, I, I still think it's great um, because of the architecture of the stadium. You're so close to... you know, So many of the fans are so close to the pitch. So I think that's something special. But you do get a great atmosphere 
at, at any Argentine stadium, despite the absence of, of, of away fans. But in, in every country, there, there, there's something. And Uruguay, you have to go to, the, to the, 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 the Centenario Stadium where the first World Cup was played. You are, you are drinking from the fountain then of, of world football. Colombia, I think, is, is a great place to watch football. I haven't been since the stadiums were all done up for the World Under-20 Cup that they staged a, a, a few years ago. And I think the, the stadiums on TV, they certainly look, look much better now. But Colombia is a, is a great country to visit and it's a great country for, fo- for football because you've got a number of cities there and, and with a different atmosphere in, in, in all of them. Um, I've, I've got happy memories. In fact, I've got happy memories of watching football in, in every country on the continent. The only one I've never been to is, is, is Bolivia, um, which is, is, is something I'll, I'll have to write. No, you can't get a boat there. Obviously, that, that, that's the problem. Um, uh, I don't I've get been that. through it. I don't get it's a, that. It's a song. It's a song. Oh, you can't right. get a boat to Bolivia. Yeah, the dainty see. song. I missed that. Eight. I missed that on that. Yeah, I'm trying sorry. to figure out where yeah, you're going with that. Silly little things in my brain that come it worked, out from, from it worked, time to time. It worked, it worked, yeah. Um, but anywhere you go in South America, there's, uh, there's an experience to be had because, and this is the great thing about football, it's, it's an experience that you don't necessarily need the language to, to enjoy. Um, when, I, when, I take me, when I take my girlfriend over to England, one of the things that I can do, with, she, she doesn't speak much English. Uh, she right. knows how to swear about football. You know, <laughs> but she, she'll say, she'll use a swear word about football, but then she'll say, comma, but is necessary. <laughs> um, because, you know, it, pay, it pays the bills. Yeah. But I can take her to a stadium and she can really enjoy the experience because she can compare it to the experience of going to football back home. So it's something that you don't need the language to enjoy. Yeah, she's been your girlfriend for many years now. 20 years. Yeah, yeah. 20 years at school, then they yeah. put you on the day shift. Right, and um, you, you do know where the church is, don't you? <laughs> well, yeah, it's, but it's not long enough to, to have arrived at any definitive conclusions. So, uh, you know. <laughs> Jimmy Manchester... <laughs> That's what I tell her. Jimmy Manchester... <laughs> Jimmy Manchester wants to know, Mark, whether you would offer Yaya Toure a three-year contract like he's been asking for at City. Yes, I, I would. Um, he's still he's still a great engine. Um, he's getting on a little bit, but uh, he's a great player, absolutely great player. And I mean, City City have, when he when he when he hasn't been at his best, City haven't been at their best either. I think. Three years, you could, you know, you could, you could develop him from a from a regular into uh, into a very steady squad player, and uh, and he could do he could do a lot uh, with with some of the youngsters coming through the the young Nigerian uh, striker, for example. He, uh, I'm sure Yaya is a great mentor to him. I think he's 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 good value for another for another three years on City's books, even if he might not be playing and he's you know playing regularly come the come the final year of, of the contract, but. But, but what a class act he is. He really is fantastic. Could you find out the background or could you tell us anything of the background of the Everton player Niasse from Senegal? Craig in Glasgow wants to know. He, well, he, he was uh, the signing that they, the recent signing that they've made um, in, the, um, in, in the transfer window. And I, I know he got into the Senegal national side just a couple of months before that. I mean, they've been a little oversubscribed with strikers with... Uh, with um, Duf from Stoke City and Demba Bar, etc. But um, uh, you know, the, 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 major, the vast majority of the Senegalese have, uh, you know, all all have had their formative football training in France, and uh, and, and he is no different. Many people have been asking uh, about Coutinho's goal the other night, Tim. I don't know. I'm sure you saw that. In any case, and uh, one listener wants to know whether it, it reached Dunga, the Brazilian. Uh, manager, coach now, whether he's finally appreciating Coutinho's talents. Well, he's in the squad, although, you know, Dunga has his favourites and a lovely little story just come up in the week. Um, One uh, who's perhaps not one of his favourites is Marcelo, the Real Madrid left-back. And he's not in the squad. And Dunga said, well, he wasn't fit. We got in touch with Real Madrid's medical people and they said he wasn't fit. And uh, Zidane, the coach of Real Madrid, said, no, I never got in touch with anyone here. He's lying. <laughs> so uh, um, as they say over here, a lie has short legs. You know, it doesn't get you very far. Um, so Felipe Calcino is back in the squad. Is he going to get a game? Uh, he's now behind in the pecking order, behind not only Neymar, but he's behind Douglas Costa as well. So uh, maybe... The, the Copa America in the States in June, that might be his big opportunity because uh, it's by no means clear. It's unlikely, I think, that Neymar will play the Copa America. So that, that shunts Filippi Calcino one place up um, the, the, the pecking order and that could be his big opportunity. 
In other words, a fib has a low centre of gravity in South America. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, because a low centre of gravity, that, 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 that can get you places, but short legs are not going to get you very far. Yeah, other fibs are available, of course, being the BBC. Bert wants to know, Tim, do you think that Spurs will win the title or will their knees go all a trembly, he says here, but you can say wobbly. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, it's it's hard to, to cheer against Leicester, isn't it? It really is hard because it, it's such a remarkable story. So uh, uh, I'm not going to be shedding any, any tears if come the end of the season, Leicester is still first. So what you're trying to say is that Tottenham will let you down again, as they always yes. do. Oh, yeah, that's, that's, that's exactly what he's That's saying. factored in. Yeah, of course. We started with that. We may as well... Defensive mechanism is well in place already. We may as well finish with that one. Having said that, Mark, Dele Ali, everybody pronounces his, that name correctly, don't they? But isn't Dele short for something else? No, no, no. Well, it can be, yeah. It's an abbreviation. No, no, like... no, but I think in his case it is. I, I read a feature on him the other day... Um... Yeah, uh, it, it, it will I be short. Or something like that. Yeah, it will be short. Like, Dotun is short for Olu Dotun. Or, oh, my, yeah. you know, my brother Yinka is Ola Yinka. Or my brother Tayo is Ibi Tayo. Or my brother Flarin is Afalarin and so on. So, usually, because they're Yoruba we names... so and so are more. Yeah, there are. There are a couple more, actually. Let's leave it at that for now, if you don't mind. They might not want me to I, advertise. I was, I was thinking, you know, when you were doing your Nigerian accent, I was thinking, is everyone in Nigeria deaf, yelling at each other in that fashion? <laughs> that is such a good question. Mark, do you no, want to answer that's, that? That's, that's across answer? the entire continent. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mark. So it's not just Nigerians who are deaf. We're talking, we are talking to you like this so that you will understand. There is, a, there is in this country a, a, a very um, funny advert for the state um, tele, telephone company where... Um, a, a man in a in a rural hut gets his first telephone after all these years, and he he calls he calls the neighbour, and they go through the whole with the, with the soft music, and he picks up the phone and the, and he shouts across <laughs> in the phone, oh no, across the you know across the valleys, and it's the it's the play on everybody shouting at everyone else, uh, even though they. They now have a telephone and no longer have to shout across the valley. Yes, yeah, a country of the Vuvuzela, after all. You don't need yes. to shout when you've got a Vuvu. Uh, that's it from us, though, for this phone in for tonight. We'll resume this phone in again next week between two o'clock and four o'clock. For now, Mark Gleason, our Springbok Junior. Thanks very much, as ever, Mark. Thank you. And Tim, many thanks for this. And uh, we'll watch as Tottenham lets us all down again, <laughs> shall we? Tim, thanks very much. My pleasure. Thank you. On digital and online. This is BBC Radio 5 Live. bbc.co.uk slash 5 Live.